Basically, I'm here to talk about cathodic protection for pipelines. As I said, my name's Chris Atkins. I'm a civil engineer. First and foremost, my first degree was in civils. Couldn't get a job, so did a PhD in corrosion. I don't look like either of those two people. Unfortunately, I do look somewhat like that gentleman there, leaning against a pile cap in Albania. Why do we need cathodic protection, I guess, is the first place to start. And effectively, it's because iron rusts fundamentally electrochemically thermodynamically it doesn't want to be steel it started life as a big mound of brown mud structurally we can't do much with a big mound of brown mud so we stick a load of energy into it and make it into steel but effectively all it wants to do is turn back to being rust and brown mud how it gets there is the physics bit electrochemistry if you stick any metal into any liquid, it'll develop a salt voltage. So here we've got zinc sat in salty water and copper sat in salty water. The voltage they develop depends on what they're made of and the liquid we stuck them in. Typically, zinc will be about minus one volt. Copper will be about plus 0.2 volts. Most voltages in corrosion are negative so that fundamental electrochemists don't have to move negative signs around but the rest of us have to deal with minus numbers just to make life slightly more awkward now as far as zinc is concerned everything in the world should be minus one volt and as far as copper is concerned everything it's touching should be plus 0.2 volts so if they're not connected together it doesn't make any difference as soon as you join them together with a wire the zinc sits there and looks at the copper and goes you're you're not minus one volt that's wrong so it starts chucking electrons at the copper and the copper sits there and looks at the zinc and goes why aren't you plus 0.2 of a volt so it takes all the electrons out the zinc is the anode officially because it's the one at the lower voltage and the copper is the cathode because it's the one at the higher voltage the zinc chucks the electrons down the wire by dissolving so it's the one that loses metal and it's the one that corrodes the cathode takes the electrons, uses them to react with oxygen and water typically and generates alkalinity on the surface. So you can't see anything going on at the copper. You can see the zinc getting smaller and smaller with time. If you've got a lot of patience, you can sit there and watch metals corrode. But it's the same kind of electricity that powers your laptop, powers your mobile phone. It's just extra low voltage DC. Here we've got a battery that's sat on my desk in work. One terminal is connected to a block of steel. The other terminal is connected to a piece of aluminium foil. And if we leave it running for about half an hour, we can watch the aluminium foil. There's a close-up picture on the right-hand side. Get smaller and smaller and smaller. As the current passes, the aluminium dissolves. And that's corrosion. And it's only the aluminium that's submerged that's corroding. So you need this con continuous and electrolyte. You need two different metals giving you a voltage. And that's pretty much all you ever need to about to know about corrosion mostly what you're interested in is how to stop corrosion and the bad news is you can't really you could make your pipeline out of gold then it wouldn't corrode structurally it wouldn't work very well and somebody would probably start stealing lumps off it so we're stuck with steel and we know steel's corroding what we can do if it's buried or immersed in the sea is move the corrosion to where we can control it and that's all cathodic protection does we make the cat pipe a cathode, that's the bit that doesn't lose metal, by sticking another anode in somewhere else. So we need to make the anode, it needs to be big enough to last, it needs to be the right size, and we need to have enough of them to be able to pass the current that's needed to protect the steel. Two choices. You can either have a galvanic system, where you stick something like zinc or magnesium in the ground, it corrodes, protects the pipe, or you can have an impressed current system where you've got an external power supply. So benefits of galvanic, you don't need external power. Problem, the anode corrodes over time, so eventually you run out of an anode. Whereas in press current, you pick a material where the anode doesn't corrode, so you don't have the same wastage issues. For galvanics, you've only got the voltage that you get out of zinc or magnesium. For an impressed system, you can turn it up or down. So design-wise, an impressed system gives you a lot more options. The galvanic anode, how big the anode is, gives you how much current you get out of it. With an impressed, 
he can stick an enormous anode in Leamington Spa, connect all the steel in the country to it, and shove an enormous amount of voltage through it. You should theoretically be able to protect it, but obviously there's going to be problems with that, with all kinds of other stuff going on. With a galvanic system, there's not much you can monitor. You can't really turn it up or down, but you do need to still monitor it to make sure it's working, because at some point you're going to run out of anode. For an impressed system, you can have all kinds of WISO fancy remote monitoring. However, a lot of the time the remote monitoring packs up because nobody pays the phone bill that you need to monitor it. Once you've installed the galvanic anode, it's difficult to get the anode the wrong way around. There's no wiring involved typically, or there's limited wiring involved. So it's fairly robust with an impressed current system. When the power packs up, the protection stops a couple of months later and the pipe starts corroding again. So that's the basic choice you've got. We're engineers typically, so we like to do hard sums. And for CP, it's how much steel is it to protect. To work that out, we need to know what the steel's painted with initially and how much of it's going to be there at the end of the life of the CP system. So we've got an initial damage from when you coated the pipe and plonked it in the ground. And then it's assumed that it breaks down at a percentage per year over its lifetime. How much current you need to stop the steel pipe from rusting depends on how corrosive the ground is. So that's where you start talking about figures like resistivity. And that's an electrical property of the ground, but it also indicates how rusty steel gets in that ground. Because if it's got a low resistivity, it's got a lot of salt and a lot of water around there and salt and water make things rust. We can either look at working out how much coating is going to be exposed and designing the system for that, or we can use a combination factor where we look at something like the coated pipe in a low resistivity style needs one to two milliamps a square meter. So we combine the coating breakdown into a single number and instead of working out the amount of steel and a different current density, we just say, nah, stick two milliamps a square meter through it. Using those numbers to protect 500 to 1000 square meters of pipe, and that's a surface area, you need about an amp. And that would protect about 530 linear meters of a 600 mil diameter pipe. So that gives us how much current we need. The next stage is work out how many anodes we need and how big they need to be to get us that one amp. For those who like complicated formulas, galvanic anodes give you lots of opportunities to pick formulas with brackets and logs and resistivities and squared and cubed terms. They are all working out the electrical resistance of a bit of metal that you plonk in the ground, and they were based on earthing calculations developed by a bloke called Dwight. If you look at some of the numbers, a one meter long, 100 millimeter diameter anode in a relatively aggressive soil has a resistance of about 0.3 to 3 ohms. And volts equals current times resistance. So if we know what the voltage is and we know what the resistance is, we can work, the, work out the current we get per anode. If we have a longer anode, we'll, it'll have a lower resistance. If we have a shorter anode, it's higher. The maximum current we get depends on the volts that we've got and the resistance of the anode. The volts you get from zinc is about 0.2 volts because to protect steel, we want to get it down to about minus 800 or minus 900. So the difference between the zinc at minus 1000 and the steel at minus 800 is 0.2. Volts of magnesium, the drive voltage is about 0.7 volts. When we've used our resistance formula, we've worked out that our anode's got a resistance of 1 ohm, because I like dividing things by 1, because that makes my maths capable. So the maximum amount of current we'll get out of that anode with a 1 ohm resistance, if we've used zinc, is 0.2 amps. And we know we need 1 amp to protect 530 metres of pipe, so we need 5 anodes to protect 530 metres of pipe. For magnesium, we get 0.7 amps out the anode, so we need 0.7 anodes to protect 530 metres of pipe. 0.7 anodes is a difficult number to buy, so you'd probably buy one or protect a bit longer of a pipe. Trouble with that is as the anode corrodes, it gets smaller, so its resistance goes up. So it's the current output at the end of life that matters, and we have to include a calculation for that. When you buy a block of zinc, you're actually buying a certain amount of 
and powers. And when you buy magnesium, it's a different factor and it depends on the Faraday equation. For zinc, you get 11.2 kilograms will give you one amp for one year. Because we know what voltage that's at, it's the 0.2 drive voltage, we actually know how many watts we get out of a kilogram of zinc and we get 156 kilowatt hours per kilogram out of zinc. When you buy electricity off the grid, you're spending about 10 to 20 pence per kilowatt hour. If you buy your electricity up front as a block of zinc, you're spending about £11, £15.50 per kilowatt hour. So it's more expensive, but obviously it's, it's a lot easier to carry a kilogram of zinc around the countryside than a kilogram of electricity. For magnesium, similar formula, the Faraday equation gives you 7.3 kilograms per amp per year, which works out as 840 kilowatt hours or £9.20 per kilowatt hour. That's the pure chemical formulas, but anodes don't work at 100% in the same way that none of us work at 100%. We don't always get everything out of it. So there is a factor regarding utilisation, which is how much of the anode can still corrode. There's, there's always going to be a bit left that's not going to be able to do anything. And we downrate it to reflect how efficient it is. Things like magnesium it wants to corrode really badly. So if you plunk that in the ground, some of the current it develops will be concentrating on corroding on its own. So it'll be self-corrosion using up. And then we basically size it so that we've got enough mass to be able to pass the current for the life. So if we look at our 530 metres of 600 mil diameter pipe that needs one amp, we will need 181 kilograms of zinc. And that'll cost us 355 quid. That's based on commodity market prices. Obviously, if you're going to an anode shop and try and buy it at that price, they're going to say, well, that's a nice idea, but we've handled it and we've processed it and we've made something out of it. But it gives you an idea of the price. If we get three number 100 millimeter diameter long, one meter long zinc anodes, that'll give us 181 kilograms. So theoretically, that would give us one anode every 175 meters. But from the previous calculation, we know we can only get 0.2 amps out of one of those anodes. So in this case, we need one amp, so we actually need five anodes, one anode per 100 metres. For magnesium, 65 kilograms of magnesium to give us the one amp for 20 years, that cost about 225 quid on the commodity market. We'd need five of them. So again, it's one every 100 metres. And that's just, that doesn't always work like that. That's just the way the mass in this example works out. So you size it based on the mass you need and the amount of current that you can get out of them. For impressed current anodes, if you've got a 25 mil diameter, one meter long titanium tube anode, it doesn't lose really any metal as it corrodes as you pass current through it. We stick it in coke backfill. So we dig a trench, fill it full of coal, shove an anode in it. That can give eight amps out. So for impressed current, Instead of having an anode every 100 metres that we got with the galvanics, we're sticking one anode to protect 2.6 miles of pipe. There's other factors you need to consider, but that's the basic difference. Galvanic, you need lots of anodes fairly close. Impressed, you can start spreading them out so you've got fewer anodes spread wider. It needs a power supply. Power supply needs to be big enough, but at 48 volts and 8 amps, that is approximately 400 watts which is probably smaller than the power supply you've got on your desk running your computer. If you haven't got any power, we haven't got any protection. Now, it doesn't instantly stop, but it will stop over a couple of months. If you haven't got any AC source, you can use solar power systems. Pipelines across Africa quite often use solar systems because mains electricity isn't kicking around. But typically, the solar system charges a wet cell battery and the batteries need topping up every couple of years, so they need maintenance. That can get forgotten, in which case all the money you've spent on the CP system packs up every night because there's no power going to it. If we protect it too hard, we can generate hydrogen gas. Hydrogen gas can soak into high strength steels if they're under a lot of tension. That can cause them to crack and fail catastrophically. So 
we don't want to turn them up too high. If we turn it up too high as well, we generate a lot of alkalinity with CP systems that can munch through your coating system and break it down, in which case you end up with more and more demand on your CP system. It would be nice and simple to think, right, we've got an impressed current system, so we can turn it up to whatever we need to, so we can be really conservative on the coating breakdown figures, design the system so that it can protect a totally burr pipe. The trouble with that is, on day one, you need to demonstrate to the pipe owner that your CP system works. And if you've designed it so that it'll run quite happily at 100 amps, but only needs one milliamp when you turn it on, that can give you all kinds of ridiculous problems where you've just over-designed it. And it's like trying to turn a volume control up to, from naught to 0 0.0001 when it runs from naught to 10. So you can't just stick conservative numbers in and get a safe design. For new build stuff, obviously it takes time to build a pipe and it takes time to stick an impressed current system on. There's no reason you can't stick galvanics in to cover, protect the pipe while it's being laid. And then once everything's in place and joined together, you can t t stick an impressed current system on. You can feasibly replace anodes. It's not difficult. You do it does involve digging a hole. It will involve access to places to get there. But it can be done. So. It's a routine maintenance item almost where you can sit there and replace the anodes every 20 years and you can look at the current that those anodes are passing at the end of 20 years and size the system based on that rather than having to again guess again how much coating systems on it. Cathodic protection is a standard thing to do to a buried oil and gas pipe or a submerged oil and gas pipe. But specifications can often be cut and pasted from the last job and they might not work. Two examples I've had. We were required to design a cathodic protection system for a pipeline. The pipeline had a three layer polyethylene coating on top of it. On top of that, it had eight inches of polyurethane foam insulation and two millimeters thick of identity polyethylene wrapped around it. The CP system would be able to pick up holes in the three layer polyethylene coating, but not through eight inches of expanding foam and two millimeters of polyethylene. The CP wouldn't work on that case unless somebody turned up and cut a hole in the insulation. There's another one we've had quite recently where an outline design, design came out and it was in the Middle East and we have to sign up to say the outline design is appropriate. And it was for replacing an existing CP system. The outline design said in 30 years time, it will need this much current. And that amount of current was actually about 20% less than it was running at now. So it's completely wrong. There's no way it's going to need less current in 30 years time than it does now. You don't do it a lot in the water supply in the UK. There's there's two suggestions as to why you don't do it a lot in the water supply in the UK. One is that you don't particularly care about pipes corroding. The other is that the wall thickness that you required, if you get in a ductile iron pipe, is typically going to be 50% of what you actually need. So in a lot of cases, you can just let it rust. Um, one final thought is there is a standard out there that defines levels of certification for CP personnel from the people wandering through the field taking data through to the designers at the top end. There are there are five levels. One is data collector, two is technician, three is senior technician, four is designer, five is godlike expert who strides across continents in a single bound and stops in rusting even by the power of the thought. But that certification scheme is in place. So you know that whoever's designing it has the right qualifications and you know whoever's installing it has the right qualifications and basically what you're trying to avoid is that picture on the left is a common problem close to where i work where basically there's lots of leaky pipes washing the ground away under the roads and occasionally big holes appear it's a fine example of health and safety because obviously there's a small child on site and the signpost in between the two of them is actually still alive because every time it went dark the light came on on the right hand side is the consequences of a failed oil and gas pipe. Um, the two lines running up through the picture are actually a three lane highway. Obviously it's slightly more dramatic than a bit of a hole in the ground, but it can still be managed by simply stopping things from rusting. Thank you all for listening. If you've got any questions, I will stop the audio recording and take them now. Cheers folks.